text this evening is Titus chapter 3. Titus 3. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were disobedient. Uh, sorry, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things. So that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law. For they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Do your best to speed Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way. See that they lack in nothing. And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works, so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. All who are with me send greetings to you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Let us pray together. Righteous Father in heaven, we thank you for preserving this word from your servant, the Apostle Paul. Righteous Father, Help us in our day-to-day -day lives to remember the good news of Jesus Christ, to remember his example, that he did not resist when he was wrongfully accused, when he was wrongfully executed, but he gave himself willingly on our behalf. Help us, Father, to remember that we are called by his name, that we claim to follow him, and that, Father, we should be as willing and as merciful as he was in our service to other people. Righteous Father, we pray that you give us an appetite for good works. Give us fruit in keeping with repentance. For righteous Father, we know that we are a wicked people. We know, Father, that we are given over constantly to sin. We know that we deserve wrath, but you have given us mercy. And Father, we know also that we are not given to do good works. And so, Father, we pray for a greater portion of your Spirit. We pray, Father, for the heart of your Son, that we might learn to respond in faith with the works that you require of us. Help us to have mercy as we have received mercy. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So Paul concludes his letter to Titus with more instructions for the church that stem from the good news of Jesus Christ. So you'll remember last week we saw in chapter 2 the focal point of the letter is this message about the grace of God. If you go back to chapter 2, verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his his own possession who are zealous for good works. 
We talked last week about how a church that is an ordered church, right? as Paul has instructed Titus to go about Crete, ordering the churches, you know, putting everything in good order. What we're ordered towards, what we're ordered around is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is the focal point of the whole letter. And what Paul does is he turns around and he presents that gospel all over again in the text that we just read in chapter 3. And he says, I insist, or I want you to insist on these things, rather, all right, so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. So he's broadening the scope of the application of the gospel out in this chapter, but it's still focused on the gospel. This is what he wants Titus to teach in Crete, that God has saved us in his grace, that he has given us the washing of regeneration, that is baptism, that he's given us the renewal of the Holy Spirit. Now, these are certainly things that have already been taught in Crete, in fact, have been believed in Crete. Right? You, you can't have a community of Christians in Crete if they've not even heard the gospel. Right? Just the basic good news of Jesus Christ. They've heard this before, but Paul insists that Titus needs to teach it to them again. Because these things are of essential importance. All right, if some of the ideas that we have read in tonight's chapter strike us as pretty basic, pretty fundamental, like the kind of stuff that you know, even your nine-year-old could tell you about the gospel, well, that's, that's because they are. Right? This is really fundamental, basic stuff. And what we learn from Paul's instructions to Titus is that we, the church, need to have the gospel put in front of us constantly. We need to be shown the heart of our faith all the time. We never outgrow hearing the gospel. Right? There's not going to be a point in this life, no matter how many times you have heard the gospel presented, there's never going to be a point where you have heard it enough. And the lesson of the gospel that Paul focuses on, the, the application of the gospel that Paul focuses on in tonight's reading, is that we ought to have mercy on others as God has had mercy on us. You look at what Paul says, We ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others, and hating one another. We deserved, and still do deserve, condemnation. But God showed us mercy. Not because of our righteousness, not because of things that we have done, but because of His loving kindness. And because we are sinners who have received God's mercy, our behavior towards others should be ruled by mercy, should be ruled by sympathy, because we know what it's like to be lost sinners. Or at least we ought to know. We ought to remember we know what it is like to receive mercy instead of judgment. And at least we ought to know. If we've forgotten, we're in, we're in bad trouble. If we've ever forgotten that. And that is why Paul says we need to be constantly reminded of these things. In this, we're like Israel. And we would do well to remember their example. Remember what's written in the law in Deuteronomy chapter 9, beginning in verse 6. It's written, Know therefore that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness. For you are a stubborn people. Remember and do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness. From the day you came out of the land of Egypt until you came into this place, you have been rebellious against the Lord. The warning is also for us to remember, hey, we're not far off from Israel. In fact, Paul teaches us elsewhere that we are grafted into Israel. We're part of this story. We are a stubborn, stiff-necked people. 
And Israel, likewise, was to treat outsiders with sympathy. The law commands, you shall not wrong a sojourner or oppress him, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. Israel was to look back at their own experience and recognize, All right, we used to be such as these people, and God had mercy on us, so we ought to have mercy on them. And we can see, the reason why I bring up the example of Israel is because we've got, we've got their whole history there in front of us. It's preserved for us. We can see what happens to a people who forget this lesson. A people who begin to think that it was because of their righteousness that they took over the promised land. A people who are not devoted to good works because of the mercy that they have received from God. In fact, we're about to see that up, real up close as we're entering into our study of Judges in the morning class. When Israel forgets that, and this is still true for us today, when you forget the mercy that God has shown you, whenever you refuse to show mercy to others, right, that is whenever you really need to start fearing the Lord. In fact, remember the parable of our Lord, who told about a man who owed a great debt and it was forgiven him. And then he turns around and he goes out and he finds a man who owes him a much smaller debt and practically strangles it out of him. And would we dare to behave as that man did? And so we must be peaceable and loving people who are zealous for good works. We are to be submissive and obedient to those in authority over us. We are to speak evil of no one. We are to avoid quarreling. We are to be gentle. We are to be courteous. In fact, Paul says perfectly courteous. And we're not being squishy or liberal whenever we say these kinds of things. We're just quoting the Apostle Paul in saying these things. There's a certain brand of so-called muscular Christianity that has gained some currency lately that practically revels in doing exactly the opposite of what Paul instructs here, that goes beyond contending for the faith, as Jude talks about, into being contentious for the faith, generally in the name of owning the libs or some other such nonsense. Now, there's no question, based on our reading of 1 Timothy and of Titus so far, that we are to stand against false doctrine and speculative teaching in the churches. Right? That's not what we're talking about. But our relationship to outsiders, our participation in the culture around us, is to be ruled by these qualities that Paul relates to Titus. Submissiveness, obedience, being gentle, being courteous, not being quarrelsome. And even when we are standing against error in the church, we're to, we're to recognize that we're doing that in part because error divides God's church. Right, this is why Paul forbids foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, quarrels about the law. So he says that such a person stirs up division. And such a person ought to be warned and then put out of the church for it. The thing for us is that we should do nothing from some misplaced desire to own anybody. Where we act from is the cross. That's what everything is ordered around and ordered toward. So the call this evening is to submit ourselves to the instructions of the Apostle Paul. To let our behavior be in accordance with the mercy that we have received in Jesus Christ. To be submissive and obedient, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, to be courteous. 
Because if we will not show mercy on others, then our Lord will not show mercy on us. The mercy of God is available to all through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the good news that we proclaim. We were all lost in sin, we were all dead, and yet we can be made alive again in Christ. So we invite any who are here who have not obeyed the gospel to believe in the good news of Jesus Christ. That he came in the flesh to live among men, that he lived a perfect life, that he died as a sacrifice for our sins, and that he was raised on the third day so that we have the hope of eternal life in him. Believe in that good news. Turn away from sin, confess Jesus as Lord, and be baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection for the remission of sins. If you're subject to the invitation, won't you come forward as together we stand and sing.